Welcome to One Mic, a Black History podcast, the show that tries to bring you untold stories from black history. I'm your host, Country Boy, and today we're talking about the Red Summer. The Red Summer is a series of race riots that plague 1919. Make sure you listen all the way through. And if you like this, you enjoy this, please consider donating to our Patreon page, which will be linked in the description. In November of 1917, Vladimir Lenin, leader of the Bolshevik Party, launched a coup d'etat against the Russian provincial government. The Russian provincial government was made of leaders of the capitalist class and the, and the Bolshevik party called the Soviet government to be ruled of a council of soldiers and workers. The, Bo- the Bolsheviks led an armed insurrection of Petrograd and seized strategic locations and were able to overthrow the provincial government and create a new government with Lenin at the head and became the world's first communist state. Why is any of this important to the Red Summer and violence against blacks and race riots? The Russian Revolution started the first Red Scare of 1919. This was an anti-Bolshevik sentiment in the United States to replace that replaced the anti-German sentiment after the World War I. Government officials viewed African Americans with some alarm because of the advocacy for racial equality and labor rights. They believed that African Americans would be the vehicle for this type of revolution to happen in America. In a private conversation of March of 1919, President Woodrow Wilson said, the American Negro returning from abroad would be the greatest medium for conveying Bolshevism in America. Bolshevism and the fear of a communist revolution in the States became the explanation and the reason to justify their violence against blacks during the Red Summer. Welcome to the Red Summer a series of race riots that took place over three dozen cities across the United States. James Wilton Johnson, who was the field secretary for the NAACP, called the violence of 1990 the Red Summer because it was so bloody. According to NAACP files, at least 38 large riots occurred over the course of 1919. The riots developed from a variety of forces, including the rise of Jim Crow, the demobilization of the United States Armed Forces following the end of World War I, an economic slump, and increased competition in the housing market and job market between whites and African Americans caused by the Great Migration. And while the racist attacks of 1919 were widespread and almost indiscriminate, in many places they were initiated by white servicemen and centered around the 380,000 black veterans who had just returned from the war. Because of their military service, because of their military service, black veterans were seen as a particular threat to Jim Crow and racial subjugation. Many of the black soldiers that returned from the war, armed with renewed determination to fight that discrimination against the near constant barrage of brutality. W.E.B. Du Bois, who at the time worked as the NAACP's Director of Publicity and Research, penned an essay called Returning Soldiers, which encapsulated the issues faced by the black soldier returning home from World War I. W.E.B. Du Bois urged returning soldiers to continue the fight for democracy at home. We are returning from the war, the crisis, and the tens of thousands of black men that were drafted into the great struggle for bleeding in France and what she means and what it has meant and what it means to us and the humanity and against the threat of German race arrogance. We gladly fought to the last drop of blood for America and for our highest ideals. We fought in a far of hope for the dominant Southern oligarchy entrenched in Washington. We fought for the bitter resignation for the America that resides and gloats in lynching disenfranchisement, the caste brutality, and devil insult for us in the hate of upturning and the mixed things we were forced by vindictive fate to fight also. But today we return, we return from slavery and uniform, which the world's madness demanded on us to don to the freedom of civil garb. We stand again and look America squarely in the face and to call a spade a spade. We sing the country of ours, despite all its better souls have done and dreamt. It's yet a shameful land it lynches, and lynching in its barbarism of a degree of contemptible nastiness unparalleled in human history. Yet for 50 years, we have lynched two Negroes a week. We have kept this up right through the war, 
It dis it disenfranchised its own citizens. Disenfranchisement is deliberate and theft and robbery of the own of the protection of the poor against the rich and the black against the white. The land that disenfranchisement its citizens and calls itself democracy lies and is known to its lies. It encourages ignorance. It has never really tried to educate a Negro. A dominant minority does what is want to the educated Negro. And it wants servants, dogs, whores, monkeys. And when this land allows a reactionary group by a stolen political power to force as many black folks into its categories as it possibly can, it cries in a contemptible hypocrisy. They threaten us with degeneracy. They will not allow us to be educated. It steals from us. It organizes industry to cheat us. It cheats us out of our land. It cheats us out of our labor. It confiscates our savings. It reduces our wages. It raises our rent. It steals our profit. It taxes us without representation. It keeps us consistently and universally poor and then feeds us on charity and derives our poverty. It insults us. It has organized a nationwide and laterally a worldwide propaganda to deliberate and continuously insult and deflame the black blood which it was found. It decrees it shall be not be possible. It decrees it shall not be possible in travel nor residence in work nor play, in education nor instruction for a black man to exist without attack or open acknowledgement of its inferiority to the dirtiest white dog. And it looks upon any attempt to question or even discuss this dogma and arrogance, unwarranted assumption and treason. This is the country to which we soldiers of democracy return. This is our fatherland for which we fought. This is our fatherland for which we fought, but it is our fatherland. It is our right to fight. The faults of our country are our faults. And under similar circumstances, we will fight again. But by God in heaven, we are cowards and jackasses if by now that the war is over, we do not marshal every ounce of our brain and brawn to fight sterner, harder, longer, and unbending battle against the forces of hell in our own land. We return and we return fighting. Wait for democracy. We saved it in France. And by great Jehovah, we will save it the United States of America or known to the reason why. Washington, D.C. in 1919 had a vibrant black middle class and in, middle, and in many ways epitomized the nation's black people. It had a slow but expanded economic and social advancements. The city's black population had grown rapidly since the Great Migration. And in 1919, they made up almost one fourth of the city's population. Blacks in Washington had a different experiences from their counterparts in northern cities because the district was more of a middle ground between the north and south. Blacks had to deal with a bit more segregation than in northern cities, but there also was less restrictive to Jim Crow laws than most of the south. This caused a strong but relatively conservative group of blacks to develop in Washington. So on Friday, July 18th, 1919, when a 19-year-old white woman was walking home from her job at the Bureau of Engraving, two black men were walking up the street the other way. The woman alleged that the two black men attempted to take her umbrella, and when she resisted, they immediately ran away. The news spread of the incident among white soldiers and sailors because the young woman was married to a, na a Naval Aviation Corps employee. But because the police acted quickly and arrested a black man for the attack, whites didn't immediately ride on Friday night. The Washington Post stoked the flames of unrest by running a headline that announced Negroes attack a girl. On Saturday, the police released a man held for Friday's assault because of lack of evidence. And the white military men became incensed. Hundreds of serious men gathered at the local YMCA and started to rampage. The mob attempted to lynch a black man and he was only able to escape after being severely beaten. On Saturday night, the servicemen attacked any black they could find, pulling them off of streetcars and beating them on the sidewalk. Police would respond to a call. When they did, the crowd would disperse, only to re reform after they left. Reports of the rioting were sent all over the country, but by Sunday morning, everyone assumed the worst was over. The blacks in NAACP 
urged the Navy to crack down against the sailors involved in the rioting, but they continued to do nothing. By Sunday night, again, hundreds of white sailors marched from the Washington Naval Yard into nearby neighborhoods, once again beating any white black man they encountered. White men packed into cars and drove around black neighborhoods, firing at passersby in what was known as terror cars. The dean of Howard University, Carter Godwin Woodson, was chased by a white mob while walking home from the Capitol. He ducked into a store entrance and watched as a serviceman attacked another black man, hoisted him up like a piece of meat, and then shot him as Woodson watched. Woodson then sneaked away as to not end up being the next black man shot. Calls came into the police station with reports of mobs roaming the northeast part of Washington. Blacks streamed into local hospitals with injuries. Blacks streamed into local hospitals with injuries and into police stations, refusing to leave until they were escorted home. By Monday, the federal government has still not taken any action. Woodrow Wilson has spent the weekend on vacation, cruising the Potomac in his yacht. He suffered a bout of dysentery, and when he returned, he went straight to bed, unaware at just how bad the situation had gotten. The district commissioner, Louis Brownlow, and the district's police chief, Raymond W. Pullman, met with Naval Secretary Josephus Daniels and War Secretary Newton D. Baker. The military offered 400 men in support of Washington's police officers, but officials were hesitant. The military commanders didn't cancel leave and rejected calls for martial law. Newton D. Baker agreed to lend military police to the city and urged sailors to maintain order and the police asked citizens to stay off the streets. The local NAACP wrote Josephus Daniels and once again implored him to crack down on his sailors who were causing trouble. That evening, the local NAACP met with Lewis Brownlow asking for officers to protect the blacks. Both Brownlow and Chief Pullman insisted that they had a situation under control. Black leaders stated that if you can't protect us, we will arm and defend ourselves. Till Monday, white mobs dominated rioting with little resistance from in black areas. That all changed on Monday when a group of four black men in a terror car sped past the Navy hospital in southeastern D.C. and opened fire on the century and any patients roaming the grounds. The men were quickly arrested, but the news was out. Blacks were fighting back and Negroes began to indiscriminately beat any white person that came into their neighborhoods. The reluctance to accept federal aid was a bit odd because it was clear that more trouble was coming and D.C. was under federal jurisdiction. So troops could be mobilized almost immediately, unlike in other cities. Brownlow insisted that his 400 member police force and several hundred lone troops had the riot under control. And even as Brownlow insisted he had the situation under control, white military men and civilians gathered in mob across the city and black veterans in the thousands formed in the streets to protect their neighborhoods. The black men set up barricades on the streets leading into their neighborhoods, and there were at least 2,000 Negroes with pistols declaring their purpose to die for their race and to and defy any white mob. By Monday evening, 400 men, mostly soldiers, gathered by the Knights of the Columbus Military Recreation Center. Riots and attacks had already been happening all over the city, but this set off a full-scale riot in downtown Washington. White soldiers hurled stones and bottles at blacks. They also ripped the blacks off of streetcars and beaten them in the streets. One rioter crushed a black man's skull with the butt of his rifle. Blacks retaliated, pulling white men from streetcars as they passed through their neighborhoods. The mob also tossed bricks at streetcars and terror cars filled with both black and white men drove through opposing neighborhoods shooting randomly. Panic swept through the city's neighborhoods, even those not consumed by the rioting. Police guards rushed up and down streets and people cowered in their apartments. During Monday night, at least four people were killed. Hospitals were overwhelmed with the injured. During Monday night, at least four people were killed and the hospitals were overwhelmed with the injured. By Tuesday mornings, the streets had cleared, but not because of any police action, but because the mobs had exhausted themselves out. Despite the chaos, Woodrow Wilson had made no public remarks. 
Woodrow Wilson was worried that the riots would make a detrimental impression in the countries which henceforth America had been regarded as the foremost exponent of social equality and justice. Wilson had put his legacy and his reputation on the establishment of mediating international disputes and spreading democracy. The race riots outside the White House most likely humiliated him as he asserted that the U.S. was a leader of democracy. Rumors started to spread of an all-out race war spreading outside of the District of Washington, D.C. It was at this point that Wilson discussed the situation with Louis Brownlow, and Brownlow still rejected declaring martial law. But after Monday night's events, he agreed to a military takeover. It was at this point that Wilson spoke to the War Secretary Newton D. Baker and directed Baker to bring in troops. While Wilson made no public statement, he sent a press release stating that he was cognizant of the situation late today and understood it to be of great concern. Baker appointed a general of William G. Hahn to restore order and Hahn dispersed 2,000 soldiers across the city of Washington, troops were armed with rifles and bayonets in order to break up the mobs. Traffic was restricted and limits put on gun sales. By Wednesday, Newton Baker had reported to the president that the city was quieter than it had been and anticipated no serious disturbances took place. And by Sunday evening of July 27th, the last of the troops were withdrawn from Washington. After four days of racist mob violence, in Washington, D.C., an estimated 40 people were killed and hundreds more injured. The chaos was only quelled just in time for the riots to spread to the city of Chicago. It would be difficult to discuss all the race riots that occurred during the Red Summer, but no riot expressed all the social issues that faced the nation, like the Chicago riot of 1919. It was also the largest and the most serious, with rioting lasting almost 13 days. Chicago in 1919 was a sprawling city that epitomized America's new industrialism. It was the nation's second largest city with, over, with almost 2.7 million people. Immigrants from all over Europe transformed Chicago with a network of segregated neighborhoods separated by language and religion. Each group had its own ethnic gang and political organizations to protect themselves from each other. But once World War I cut off immigration from Europe in 1914, the competition between the groups intensified. By 1919, only 4,000 immigrants had moved to Chicago. The restriction on immigration and the loss of 5 million men who left to go serve in the armed forces caused a major shortage of cheap labor, and businesses in the North turned to Southern blacks. Companies sent agents to the South to recruit blacks, and Southern blacks took the opportunity to leave the oppressive economic conditions of the South. Black families didn't need a reason to leave the South. After a generation of living under violence, Jim Crow, and a lack of political rights, some of the jobs were so desperate for workers, they would pay blacks to migrate to the North. So black took these free tickets, or in some cases, saved for group fares, because they saw Chicago and the North in general as an escape route from the oppression of Jim Crow. By the end of 1919, some 800,000 blacks had left the South. In the decade between 1910 and 1920, the black population in northern cities grew by large percentages. New York grew by 66%, Chicago by 114%, Philadelphia by 500%, and Detroit by 611 What seemed like the promised land was actually a fierce competition for jobs and housing. Southern blacks encountered a very different type of racism in northern cities. In the South, they were relegated to second-class citizens, status by Jim Crow and a social hierarchy. In the North, in the North, they were seen as an alien invasion that needed to be stopped or contained by ethnic groups that weren't doing that much better than they were. Black relations with organized labor unions have always been complicated. Overwhelming majority of black workers were ununionized. Overwhelming majority of the black workers were ununionized. And many of the Southern blacks were hired as strike breakers. While majority, of the, while majority of the white workers were unionized, this caused resentment against blacks amongst many of the working class whites. The nation's economy made race relations and labor relations much, much worse. It also meant that returning blacks and white soldiers found little work and the price of goods shot up post-war. While wages increased, they were only good if you were employed. If you were unemployed, the increase of goods was, very, was difficult to handle. The recession of the economy led to a wave of strikes as workers fought for better working conditions and wages 
so they could afford the increase in daily goods. These relations didn't only extend to locating work, but also in housing. Blacks were confined to a small section of the west side of Chicago and a small and a strip of neighborhoods on the south side that was called the Black Belt. The Black Belt held 90 percent of the blacks in Chicago and most other homes were dilapidated and weighed overpriced. Whites near the Black Belt were frightened into selling their homes low for fear of a black invasion. Those houses were then turned around and sold high or rented to blacks who were eager for any place to stay. Because of forced segregation, the blacks had no choice but to pay the high cost for substandard housing in the black belt. Black families fought the overcrowding and the need to locate decent housing forced them to push the boundaries of the black belt. The blacks hated being squeezed into a zone of substandard housing. The black people hated being squeezed into substandard overpriced housing and the whites felt like they had been encroached into that carefully carved area of Chicago. The riot started on July 27th, 1919. Chicago had been oppressively hot, reaching the 90s every day. And on this day, it was 96 degrees. Many Chicagoans had the same idea and go of going to the beaches of Lake, of Lake Michigan. In Chicago, even the beaches were segregated. The south side of Chicago had a white beach that started on 29th Street and had a colored beach that was rocky and uneven and started on 25th Street behind several factories. On this day, five teenagers, Charles and Lawrence Williams, Paul Williams, John Harris, and Eugene Williams decided to go to the beach, but they didn't head to the Black Beach. Instead, they headed to a secret beach that they called the Hot and Cold. It was a rocky inlet near a brewery that shot hot water into the inlet and an ice company that shot freezing cold water into the same inlet. Only the, t- only the teens knew about this beach. And they made a they made a raft out of old logs and pushed it out into the lake. And as it drifted along, it slowly gave way southward towards the white beach. Earlier in the day, the white only beach had had several African Americans attempt to enter the water. A white mob formed and tried to drive them away by hurling rocks at them. The blacks came back. The blacks came back with reinforcements and started throwing their own rocks. A larger group of whites formed and then scared away those blacks. The boys had no idea about the incident earlier in the day, but they did see a white man tossing rocks at them. The, bo- the boys dove underwater as to not be hit with the rocks and weren't overly concerned with the white man until Eugene Williams sank into the water and didn't come back up. John Turner Harris later stated that he saw Eugene get struck in the forehead with a rock and attempted to help his friend, but he disappeared underwater. The lifeguard from the Black Beach and several black men ran over and frantically looked for Eugene. Police arrived and they drugged the lake and recovered the lifeless body of Eugene Williams. The boys told the black blacks of the Black Beach what had happened and pointed to the man and pointed to a man by the name of George Starber as the man as the man who threw the rocks. One of the police officers, a man by the name of Daniel Daniel Callahan, refused to arrest Starber and wouldn't allow the black officer on the scene to arrest him either. As the blacks grew more and more angry at Callahan, he arrested a black man based on a crowd complaint by one of the white men at the beach. Meanwhile, Starbert hid in the crowd of whites. As news spread about the incident at the beach, blacks began to gather their way to the white beach. They demanded the police to turn over off of the Callahan and the rock throw with Starbert. The police attempted to get the crowd to disperse, but by 6 p.m., a black man by the name of James Crawford over open fire on the officers. He was shot and killed by the police. And this only angered the black mob even more. They began attacking white men who attempted to leave the beach. In total, four men were beaten, five were stabbed, and one was shot. The people leaving the beach spread the news of the shooting, the attacks on whites, and as night fell, white gangs began to show on the western edge of the black belt and began to attack any black passing through the white neighborhoods. The next day, on Monday morning, the riot made front-page news across the country. Following the riots in Washington, that had rattled the nerves of the nation, as soon as things had calmed. People were going about their jobs like they had always done, but trouble was still brewing. The heat was brutal, and children were out of school, but not a single person was at the White Beach. The rumors that blacks had, had amassed almost 2,000 rifles and were preparing themselves at an attack on the white neighborhoods. This caused scattered fighting to break out throughout the day and white mobs grew larger and larger with a mix of different ethnic groups who at one time fought each other but rallied together against a common enemy, the blacks. 
For the years leading up to the riot, blacks had complained about the white police officers. Only 200 of the 3,800 police officers in Chicago were black. So a committee of black leaders spoke to the police chiefs, the police chief, James Garrity, and he assured that the blacks would be treated equally and the situation was under control. He sent 150 patrolmen to the black belt on special duty and the, and the state militia units were called up but not put into action. As night fell on Monday night, white riders roamed from block to block with no other objective other than attacking blacks and gangs of armed black men formed to attack any whites that had the misfortune of entering their neighborhood. The worst incident for Monday night was a rumor of a sniper firing from a white occupied area at the edge of the black belt into the black community. Over 1,500 blacks gathered outside and they demanded the police search the area and catch the shooter. The police searched the building, but no sniper or weapons were ever found. The mob still angry about the alleged shooter talked to Bricks at the police. The police fired at the crowd, killing three black men as the crowd fled. By Tuesday morning, 17 people had been killed. 172 blacks and 71 whites had been seriously injured. And the south side of Chicago still rang out with gunfire and police sirens. The city government ordered its black employees to stay home. And thousands of black employees who took the trolleys were stopped from going into work because they didn't want to risk walking through white neighborhoods. At the height of the riot, 2,800 of the city's 3,000 on-duty police officers were patrolling the south side. The police ordered the citizens of the Black Belt to stay inside and obey the police. Rumors spread about violence against blacks and whites. The whites told stories of blacks with tons of weapons and ammunition ready to invade the white area. And the blacks told stories of mass graves near the stockpiles. The police, thought the police department suffered a manpower shortage and even asked citizens to work for free as traffic cops while they fought the riots. Mail was delayed, road repairs stopped, and the city's hospitals were overflowing with bullet wounds, stabbing, and other injuries. By Wednesday, sporadic fighting continued. The blacks attempted to return to work, but were only met with angry workers. The black leaders of Chicago pressed the state and local politicians to act. They accused the police of failing to protect black citizens and demanded equal rights. The blacks have been trapped in their apartment for three days. The blacks have been trapped in their apartment for three days. They crowded police stations for protection, but now they were running out of food and money. No supplies flowed into the black areas because they were afraid of the violence in the black belt. And after four days of rioting, the mayor still refused to call in the state militia. Wednesday evening, fires broke out across the black belt. Reports came in that white folks were starting fires in black homes. The blacks set up barriers and started firing on any white person they saw, opening fire on several police officers that came into their neighborhood. It was at this time that Mayor Thompson decided he needed to call in the state militia, but he didn't call for martial law. He asked for military assistance. The troops would not take over the local authority. They were just coming to supplement them. That evening, 6,000 troops from the Illinois Reserve Militia showed up on the south side of Chicago. They took up positions where the worst areas of fighting occurred. Their one directive was to maintain the peace. They dispersed any mob they formed, and most of the soldiers, many of the soldiers, thought the blacks were at fault when they arrived in the black belt. But they saw the homes, but they saw the homes of black families looted, others smoldering with their furniture laying out in the street. Sterling Sterling Moulton, the captain of the of the state militia, recalled, generally speaking, the Negroes were orderly after the initial riots, which they acted largely in self defense, aggravated by the very real fear of a massacre. And on Thursday, the militia helped get the city back up to normal. While attention stayed high, the troops presented weapons to deter any troublemakers and had machine guns that were set up at intersections. During this entire riot, the federal government sat on their hands. Woodrow Wilson claimed he was fully informed of the situation in Chicago and was completely prepared to order troops at any moment. But ultimately, he did nothing about the largest race riot during the Red Summer, even though the violence dominated the news. By the end of the riots, 537 people had been seriously wounded, 322 blacks, 178 whites, with 38 dead, and approximately 1,000 people out of their homes, and approximately 1,000 people who lost their homes, and approximately 1,000 people lost their homes. 1919 should remember, 1919 should have been a year of peace with the way the world defeated autocracy. Woodrow Wilson stated that we should be drawn together in a combination of moral force that, ir- that is irresistible. Blacks in the United States hoped that 1919 would usher in a new age of prosperity and freedom. They also believed their participation in the, they also believed that their participation in the war effort 
had earned them equal rights that they had been promised. They thought that they were on the edge of being seen as equals and felt betrayed and angry at the violence against them in, during 1919. But something had changed. They were experiencing in France and in, and in factories, the African Americans began to fight back against the mobs and they organized political organizations like the NAACP. Blacks reacted to the riots in Bolden and was a turning point for blacks in America. Stanley B. Norville wrote, the 500,000 Negroes were sent overseas to serve their country, but they brought back contracts that, that widened both their perception and their perspectives. It broadened them. It gave them new angles on life and on government and what it meant. They were new, new men in a new, new world. And if you please, into their possibilities for direction and guidance to use their power is limitless. They only need to be instructed and led. They have been awakened, but they have yet to complete the conception of what they have awakened to. The Red Summer shined a bright light on American race relations. It should be viewed as a chronic illness in this country. The Red Summer was a spasm of brutality that rose as black Americans attempted to reach for true equality. The Red Summer is a story of destruction, but also a story of beginnings, because it was the beginning of the freedom movement. Before the war, the NAACP had only 9,000 members, yet by the end of the early 20s, it had over 100,000. As, vi as the violence unfolded, the NAACP became the primary civil rights organization and signaled a growing boldness and cohesion in blacks organizing what eventually would be the seeds of the civil rights movement. Thank you for joining us tonight. Please follow us on Twitter at One Mike History. And if you haven't already, please check out the Cup podcast as we discuss today's black culture. And lastly, please consider donating to our Patreon page so I can continue to get, bring you dope content. But before you go, show some love to your favorite new podcast by subscribing and reviewing us on Apple Podcasts. Peace.